You may not have guessed it, but I'm actually a big fan of fragrances. I like how certain smells can make you feel and the memories they can bring back to you. Every time I smell vanilla or coconut for example, I'm immediately transported back to my childhood holidays in Spain. All that's to say, fragrances are powerful and intriguing beasts. Which is why I'm happy to introduce today's sponsor, Scentbird. The company that's reimagining everything about how we discover, shop for, and even experience fragrances. Scentbird lets you choose a new designer fragrance to try every month for just $17. With each fragrance, you'll get a 30 day supply in one of these well made, travel friendly vials, so you can try out fragrances before committing to a full bottle. They have a wide range of perfumes, colognes and unisex options to choose from, and carry brands like Prada, Gucci and Versace, as well as independent labels. This month I received 3 amazing fragrances. First up, I chose the king of the men's fragrance world, Creed Aventus. This bad boy usually sets you back a few hundred dollars for a full size bottle, so Scentbird's an affordable and sensible way to enjoy these luxury brands. It's full of sophisticated warming notes, bergamot, pineapple and patchouli, very masculine. Next I got Yuso Vert, Joga. Really fresh and floral, just the perfect after shower scent that's bound to turn some heads. Finally, my favourite one of the bunch, Raw Spirit, Wildfire. I love unique aftershaves like this. It's a really seductive, exotic blend of jasmine petals, lang lang, cedarwood, Australian sandalwood and musk. Just beautiful. So if you're still searching for your signature scent, or just want to try a bunch of fragrances for a great price, head over to scentbird.com. Use my coupon code LAZY55 for 55% off at Scentbird. It's just a little over $7 for your first month, available in the USA and Canada. Thank you Scentbird for the sponsor. Check out their links below. It's not unheard of for streamers to do atrocious things live on camera in the pursuit of clout, but this is the first time that I've come across one who has used a stream to cover up his off-camera atrocities. Northern Irish streamer Stephen McCullough, better known by his username VoteSaxon07, was a popular YouTuber who specialised in toy reviews. If you're a fan of Doctor Who memorabilia, you may have heard of him. And yet, despite his relatively frequent upload schedule, if you head over to his channel right now, you'll notice that his last video was posted about 3 weeks ago. Now it's not unusual for YouTubers to take breaks to avoid burnout, but the reason behind Steven's absence is much more sinister than that. On December 18th, 2022, the body of Steven's girlfriend, 32 year old Natalie McNally, was found inside her Silverwood Green home. She had been stabbed multiple times and her hands and arms were covered in defensive wounds. Natalie was 15 weeks pregnant at the time of her slaying, and she had no doubt fought not only for her own life, but for that of her unborn sons. After examining the scene, investigators realised there were no signs of a forced entry, indicating that Natalie both knew and trusted her killer, at least well enough for her to unlock the door for them while she was home alone. In such cases, the victim's partner is usually considered the prime suspect. However, our man Stephen had a rock solid alibi. At the exact time that the murder had taken place, he happened to be hosting a live stream on his YouTube channel. The 6 hour long stream clearly showed Stephen in his Lisbon home playing video games on the night that his girlfriend was slain, and proved that he couldn't have been the person who took Natalie's life. Many of Stephen's subscribers had watched the stream live on December 18th, so if he were to ever be charged, there would be plenty of witnesses to speak in his defence and say that he was indeed home on the night that the slaying occurred. Irrefutable evidence of his innocence, you may be thinking. Well, initially, the investigators thought the same, and despite taking him in for questioning, they were forced to let Stephen walk free. That is, until some new, damning evidence came to light. Detectives decided to take a look at some of the CCTV footage from the night of the incident, captured in areas around Natalie McNally's home. And wouldn't you know it, a surveillance camera caught Stephen riding a bus from the scene of the crime. According to analysts, Stephen could be seen wearing a yellow rubber glove underneath a black glove as he paid the bus driver. That stuck out to investigators. 
traces of a yellow marigold cleaning glove were found on a blood smear in Natalie's home. Well, after combing through more than 4,000 hours of footage from different surveillance cameras, detectives were able to trace all of Stephen's movements on December 18th, from when he arrived on Natalie Street at 8.52pm, to when he left her house at 9.30, to him taking a combination of public transport and a taxi back to his home. It was all there in grainy black and white. Stephen clearly was the man responsible for ending Natalie's life. And yet, that just didn't make sense. Thousands of people had watched Stephen playing video games in his home at the time of the incident. How could he have been in two places at once? The simple answer is, he wasn't. Stephen's December 18th livestream had been pre-recorded. He had filmed the video days before he killed his partner, and planned to use it as an alibi. Shortly before departing from his home and heading to Natalie's, Stephen began his fake stream which he titled, The Violent Night Christmas Live Gaming Stream. This went out to his viewers, who all believed that they were watching a live video. Natalie herself even liked Stephen's tweet announcing the stream was live, unaware that in that moment, he was on his way over to kill her. After looking at the video, there were a few signs that the stream itself had been pre-recorded. At the very beginning, for example, Stephen remarks that he won't be able to read the live chat due to technical difficulties. Well, because this streaming software is kind of up the left, it means I can't check the live chat, which is a real shame. So, by all means, talk amongst yourselves. I could use my phone to dip in every now and again and uh, check it, but I've decided that I kind of hate live streams where people just sit and read comments and go, Oh my god, yes, ask me questions, better. Um, and also, if I go on my phone for too long, I'll end up just scrolling through TikTok and the amount of time that I've lost scrolling through TikTok is unbelievable. So yeah, phones away. Can't look at the live chat for some bloody reason because if I do, it makes the whole thing freeze and OBS just screws up. Throughout the stream, he kept on awkwardly bringing up the fact that he wouldn't be interacting with the chat. Obviously, because for him, there was no live chat for him to be interacting with. That didn't stop his viewers from typing away during the pre-recorded stream though, all of them oblivious to the fact that they weren't watching their favourite YouTuber live, but actually the recording of a cold and calculated killer, using them for an alibi. Throughout this live stream, Stephen even seemed to drop little hints about his plan. 3 hours, 26 minutes, and 24 seconds into the video, while Stephen is supposedly taking a break, he flashes a No Time To Die poster on the screen. After the break ends, he smirks and says it was a simple mistake. Given when Stephen began his pre-recorded stream, that No Time To Die image would have appeared at 9.26pm, the time that Natalie Skiller was inside her home, murdering her. At a different point, he even says Natalie's name outright. Yeah, that's, that's physics. That's, that's what would happen in the real world. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> so why would Stephen leave these seemingly intentional hints throughout the video? Narcissism perhaps? Duper's delight? Or perhaps he wanted people to pick up on them? Who can say? When detectives see Stephen's computer, they found the video of the staged livestream, and the metadata proved that it had been filmed four days before the killing. They also learned that following the slaying, Stephen visited Natalie's parents 
and left his phone behind at their house on record. This was his makeshift bugging device, so he could determine whether they suspected him or not. He returned 40 minutes later to collect his phone, which he pretended he had left behind by accident. On February 2nd of this year, Stephen was charged with Natalie's murder. During his first court hearing, he admitted to striking a previous romantic partner in the face back in 2019, and also to faking the livestream on his channel, though he vehemently denied having anything to do with Natalie's demise. Now it seems that his video alibi is going to be used as proof of premeditation. It's important to note that this case is still fresh and ongoing, and that Stephen is yet to stand trial and be found guilty. But with such a mountain of evidence against him, I think it's safe to say that the right man's been charged. Now the only question is, what compelled him to take the life of his pregnant partner? His excuse, whatever it may be, is of course irrelevant. The fact of the matter is that two innocent lives were taken by a cold and calculating individual who no doubt thought he was smart enough to get away with his actions. Stephen's infamous livestream is still up on his channel. Watching it now, knowing why he made it and what he was planning, is unsettling, to say the least. Attack, panic, attack. That's what we're doing. On September 19th, 2022, Queen Elizabeth II's funeral procession was broadcast live throughout the world by numerous TV stations. One of those broadcasters was ITV, one of the UK's major free-to-air networks and the second most watched channel behind BBC One. It was during that news coverage, as the procession came to an end and Her Majesty's body was being driven to Windsor, that a strange audio message interrupted the program. Death is irreversible, and the fact that she's trapped. As you can see... Well, as you can see here in London, it is a lovely day, and as the hearse heads out into West London... Just before a male reporter began describing the unfolding events live on air, a still unidentified woman with an English accent was heard whispering the words, the death is irreversible, and the fact is, she's trapped now. Others seem to hear the fact that she's trapped now. The death is irreversible, and the fact that she's trapped As you can see... The voice is then cut off by the presenter. It's unclear whether this cryptic message was aimed at the viewers directly, or whether this woman was simply talking to a colleague, and her words were accidentally picked up for the world to hear. Whatever the case, though, she had certainly caught the public's attention. The content of the voice's message was creepy enough on its own, but given the context, her words took on an altogether more disturbing meaning. It sounded to many listeners as if this woman was talking about the Queen herself, and that she had accidentally, or intentionally, revealed some top secret information. That the government, or some type of clandestine organisation, had tried to reanimate Elizabeth II, only for her spirit to somehow become stuck somewhere. Even weirder, it seemed to imply that to the most powerful in society, methods do already exist to make death reversible, or at least that transferring consciousness is possible. Others remarked that the voice sounded eerily similar to that of the late Princess Diana's. Well, we had, a, we had unique pressures put upon us. And we both tried our hardest to cover them up, but obviously it wasn't to be. The death is irreversible, and the fact that she's trapped. As you can see. Of course, a more rational explanation would be that this hushed woman was simply another reporter practicing lines or speaking abstract nonsense to warm up her voice. This reporter had either left her microphone on by mistake or she was broadcasting on a different network, and her audio signal got picked up by ITV. 
Those are both possibilities, sure. I've also seen one source claim that the voice was from a guest of the male news reporter, and her words were picked up by his microphone. That does sound plausible too. There are also those that hear the word travelling instead of trapped, which makes a lot more sense given the circumstances. But even so, who just drops the line, the death is irreversible, into casual conversation? It's such an unnecessarily strange statement to make, especially during a news report. ITV is yet to explain the broadcast interruption themselves, so all we can do is speculate on what this woman was talking about, why she said it in such a strange way, and how it wound up on live TV in the first place. Ekaterina Didenko is a popular Russian influencer with 1.5 million Instagram followers. A med school graduate and trained pharmacist, she regularly posts videos related to health and life advice. Oftentimes, this advice is questionable, with Ekaterina telling her followers to make use of homemade medicines instead of going to the doctor. Despite many criticizing her for making potentially dangerous content, that hasn't stopped Ekaterina from amassing a sizable audience and creating a successful business online. Though interestingly, a lot of that success came after she began documenting a very dark chapter of her life. In February of 2020, Ekaterina was celebrating her 29th birthday with friends and loved ones at a party in Moscow. The event, of course, had to be a spectacle, since Ekaterina was eager to not only enjoy the party herself, but to also make posts about it for all of her followers to see. To help her celebrate the occasion in style, her devoted husband, 32-year-old Valentin Dedenko, had planned quite the extravaganza. In fact, he had a grand secret up his sleeve his piece de resistance. The Steam Show. The sauna complex where they were hosting the party had a very special amenity. A swimming pool. Inspired by a popular trend in Russia at the time, Valentin planned to gather all of the guests inside the enclosed pool room, and then drop 25 kilograms of dry ice into the water, essentially creating a dry ice hotbox. After eating and drinking and joking around together, Valentin led all of the guests into the pool room to enjoy the main event, handing out goggles and protective suits to wear. He then shut the doors, wanting his smoky display to last as long as possible. Ekaterina herself recorded what happened next. As expected, as soon as the dry ice hit the water, a huge amount of fog blanketed the pool's surface and quickly began to fill the small room. Spurred on by the crowd, Valentin then jumped into the pool and disappeared under the fog. The partygoers all cheered and laughed as he did, with one of them, possibly Ekaterina, joking. That's it. He's dead. He's no longer with us. those words would turn out to be eerily prophetic. When dry ice reacts with water, the thick gas that it creates isn't just harmless water vapour. It's highly concentrated carbon dioxide. If breathed in in large amounts, CO2 is toxic to humans and causes asphyxiation and death. And Valentin was now inside the eye of the storm, unable to breathe both above and below the water's surface. Valentin reappeared on camera just once after that, flailing and gasping for air, his friends sure that he was just trying to make them laugh. But when he failed to come back up a second time, they slowly began to realise that something wasn't right. Made all the more clear when several of them began to feel sharp pains running through their bodies, and they all began suffering from a shortness of breath. Everybody started evacuating the room, but for three of them, it was too late. Valentin and two other guests, Natalia Monakova and Yuri Alfarov, suffocated at the scene. Following the tragedy, Ekaterina's behaviour was… unusual. 
as her husband lay dying in a hospital bed, Ekaterina livestreamed what was happening, and even posted this very same video to her social media account for her viewers to watch, despite the fact that it showed her husband and two of her friends moments before their untimely ends. Following this, she continued to document the incident, and many have accused her of using her husband's death to gain more views and followers. If true, it was a successful strategy, since all of her accounts grew massively following the pool party incident. Many put her strange behaviour down to her being terminally online, with one psychologist stating that a Katerina, quote, is so immersed in the virtual world that it's difficult for her to realise where reality is and where it's not. But there are others who have suggested that Ekaterina's behaviour stemmed from something more sinister. That Ekaterina either didn't care about her husband, or actively wanted him out of the picture. In their minds, there's no way that a trained pharmacist with experience in chemistry wasn't aware what would happen when you combine dry ice with water in a confined space. To be clear, that's all speculative, and the authorities consider the incident to have been a case of misadventure. Still, even though everyone grieves in their own way, her behaviour was undoubtedly strange. Less than three months after her husband passed away, Ekaterina began dating a 22-year-old actor. Just five months later, she announced that they were engaged. She remarried in March of last year, just one year after the death of her previous husband, Valentin, the man who tried to make her 29th birthday one that she would never forget. I suppose in one sense, he succeeded. Thank you Semper for the sponsor. Check out their links below. Use my coupon code LAZY55 for 55% off at Scentbird. A huge thank you to all of my supporters here on YouTube and over on Patreon, especially my biggest supporters. Aaron McKee, Alex Greensall, Asia Mina, Azrael Warakai, Brad Hammer 33, Cassidy Simpson, Chief Kochuake, Colin Monsma, Connor Lothan, Corbin Lowick, Dustin and Tiffany Vanderpool, George Lopez, Gina Valera, Ian Billock, Infamous Sempapi, Jesse Juck, Leonardo Martinez, Liam Brady, Monica Mendoza, Mrs. Avon Rankin, Peter Logdrach, Philip Wester, Taylor and Monica Gruenk, The Only Dorita, TNS Mum, Zane, Peyton Trolling, Itai Allon, Nefus1988, and Lydia Cumo. Thank you guys so much for your continued support.